flew here, and my GPS took me through the mountains. <laughs> but fortunately, I'm a mountain girl because I lived in Western North Carolina for many years. So um, I was used to it. But on the way home, I'm taking 64. <laughs> so um, I appreciate you being here, and I understand there's some excitement to this because this community wants to move to uh, actually using this work uh, together, not just separate separate sectors. And you're going to be looking at this and deciding today if this is something that you are attracted to. Uh, we draw on the law of attraction, as they say. <clears throat> I was telling Jerry that in 1999, we left our day jobs to, after we had uh, co-authored Bridges with uh, Ruby Payne, Phil Duvall and I, and I asked him, how long do you think it's going to be before I, we have to get real jobs again? Because I couldn't imagine that this book that we had written would go for very long, that we would be out speaking. He said probably about two years, and that was in 1999. The thing that happened was that people used our work in ways we had never thought of. The first sector to use our work was actually the private sector, businesses. There was a, a community in Grand Rapids that had a welfare to career program at, Grand, at uh, Cascade Engineering. And they had a very bad retention rate. So those that employ folks in poverty sometimes spend a lot of money because it, the retention problems cause the business to have a lot of extra <clears throat> income loss. And so they changed their retention rate from 20% to 80% retaining employees from in this welfare to career program in just six months. And that was primarily because they were such a solid organization, a Covey organization, an organization about relationships. So we began learning that, that's really very loud. We began learning that people were going to use our work in ways we hadn't thought of. And it has continued this way. So we're now in seven to nine countries, mostly English-speaking countries. Um, <clears throat> Australia, uh, Scotland, Ireland, the UK, Canada. There's a very strong Bridges Initiative in Ontario because they have an Ending Poverty Initiative in Ontario. So this is who we are. Um, I am, you know, I was a music teacher and I ended up in alcohol and drug prevention and somehow that led to this. And I am one of you. I'm just somebody, I, I always say it's kind of like being struck by lightning that this happened, but I'm very glad because what a difference it has made for so many people in America. So I hope that you are attracted to it. If you're not, that's fine. But um, if you are, I hope that you'll be able to work together in new ways to accomplish a few things. One of the things we'd like to always accomplish is to get individuals in poverty to our decision-making tables. How many of you have sat at a table and talked about what your community in poverty needed, but there was nobody in poverty at that table? Has that ever happened? How do you get people in poverty at the table? Somebody said, people in poverty don't want to come to our table. We have to ask ourselves why that is. Is it scheduling? Is it simply because it's when people in poverty may be working? Or is it because we don't have a bridge of relationship? How do we make people of all economic classes, of all genders, of all orientation, of all cultures and ethnicities feel comfortable and have a voice? That's a big process. So today we're going to look at just the economic class part of that. But we know that we have to be able to reach out to one another. I was telling Jerry, as he was interviewing me, this is really not about people who are better off reaching to somebody in poverty and, and pooling someone, right? This is about coming shoulder to shoulder and working together with people in new ways and in more insightful and innovative ways than we'd ever thought of before. So throughout the day, I will be giving you some little tidbits of strategies. Things that you can change on Monday morning. You know, when you, well, or tomorrow morning. Or things that may take a while to develop, right? So those things are kind of in, embedded, right? But basically, the number one thing I'm going to be sharing to you, with you today is called the Bridges Lens. And the Bridges Lens will go over. It's actually on your agenda. But it's just the Bridges way of looking at things 
And that's the first strategy, is to have a new lens. And once the lens is there and you share it and you have a common lens, it gives you more traction on the great things that you want to accomplish in your community. Now, this is a very interactive day. So look at the people you sat with. How many of you are sitting with people that you work with every day? Would you raise your hand? Okay, you must really like those people. Why do we sit with people we work with every day? It's not that we love these people, I know that. I've had real jobs. But we feel comfortable, right? We know what we have when we're sitting next to them. It would be wonderful if there was someone at your table you didn't work with every day. Why? Or that was from a different sector. Why? Because you would get to hear a different perspective, a different idea. Are we open to that? I hope so. But we don't really seek out to sit with people that we do not know. But how many of you are happy to sit with people that you don't work with every day? So good. So you're going to have to, you're going to have the challenge of, of finding out who, who they are. So this is a very interactive day. So hopefully you sat by people that you kind of like. And uh, if, if, may I just say, if when I say uh, talk to your neighbor or talk at your table, you hear your voice first every time, kind of back off a little and let some other people uh, talk as well. And I'm sure that everyone will appreciate that. So I brought you some door prizes. I heard that, uh, let's see who's here. How many of you are here from K-12 education? Okay, pretty good. They're mostly sticking together in the back. You must have got here late. That's one of the hidden rules of professional development or church is what? Where do you sit? Hidden rules. Unspoken cues and habits of an environment or a group. So the people that come later have to sit in the front. I promise I won't pick on you, okay? <laughs> you have trifocals, okay? How many, oh, that's why she's up here. She was not late. How many of you are from health, the health sector, either public health? Okay, mostly over here. Do you know these people over here? Okay, so wave, because she's from health too. Okay, how about early childhood, K-5, K K-4, <coughs> earlier than that? What, prenatal? <laughs> preschool, okay, preschool. I said K-4, but I meant preschool. Anyone here from like Head Start? Anything like that? Okay. Uh, anyone here from the private sector, business? Good. Faith-based? Good. What other sector did I forget? How about higher ed? Wow, great. You've done a really good job of coming together. What other sectors did I miss? Oh, law enforcement, courts? Got my fingers crossed. Good. That's a good one. Arts Anyone else? Culture. What is it? Arts and culture. Arts and culture. There's two of you? <laughs> Very good. Wow. Social services. Either county social services or, um, help me with this, my brain is on uh, Mucinex. Um, oh, I can't think of it. Nonprofits, both. Let me see all so social services again. All right, thank you. Forgive me. Someone said something else. Community services. Community services? Okay. Mental health. I was here from behavioral health and mental health. Any addictions, people like we were? Okay. Have no addiction problems here, huh? Right. The addiction people are out there working hard today. <laughs> here we go. The first step. Uh, did you see on the news this week that we're more likely to die of an overdose now than we are in a car crash? Like one out of 98 uh, people in America die of an overdose. <clears throat> Pretty bad. Anything else? Civic organizations. Pardon me? Civic organizations. Okay, who's here from civic organization? Okay, and any foundations? We always want to know who you are. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, anyone we forgot? Local government? Super. Lots of local government sitting in the back. I got my eye on you back there. All right, I brought two books for you. One is called Getting Ahead in the Workplace. Does anybody in here do, uh, train people in job skills? Okay. Or is it those of you in the private sector who may employ people from different economic classes? Getting Ahead is the reason that we're still here after 20 years. 
Yeah. It's the bridges for individuals who are in either situational but mostly generational poverty. How many generations is generational poverty? Two or more, usually by three generations. It's socked in. I wanted you to think of the folks that you work with in your services, and whether they're patients, students, employees. Of those that are in poverty, what percent of that poverty is generational? Talk at your table. Those that are in poverty that work with you in your services or employed by you, what percent of that poverty is generational? Okay, let's do that. Do you have the number in your head? What percent? So generational poverty, two or more generations, what percent of the folks you're working with are in generational poverty? I'm expecting it to be pretty high, but I might be surprised. How many of you said lower than 40%? What is 42%? Who knows what that is? In physics and in social services. It's called critical mass. What does that mean? That means that 42% or more of us have a certain orientation or experience. We're going to have to have greater understanding because it gives that group more traction and it's going to, uh, it's going to impact our strategies, how we do business, our programs. It's going to have a big impact. Okay, how many of you are saying between 50 and 80% generational poverty? And how many of you are saying 80% or higher? Lots. So let's just hit, see a show of hands. 42% and above generational poverty. Look around. You're looking at me and I think you should be looking at one another. I think that's the goal today. It's not just to be looking at me. I'm going to try to disappear behind my coughs and let you talk to one another about this and apply the meaning of what this means to you. So when you have that much generational poverty, and these gener that means poverty is really socked in. Just, do you think that our environments have an impact on us? Or is all our individual character? Right. So we have different, different views on relationships in our different environments. What's important in a relationship? We have different priorities. Have you ever saw a decision that somebody made in poverty and you go, what the heck? Where did that come from? Right? You can find the same thing with people in generational wealth. In generational wealth, there's just a different environment and decisions are made very differently. For example, it's a very inclusive world, ex exclusive world, not inclusive. So let's just say you belong to a faith that's very inclusive, but your economic class is very exclusive. What are you going to have to do? You're going to have to wrestle with that, right? So this is part of relationships, it's all about priorities, it's all what makes decisions. I attended a session in Chicago um, from Kaiser Permanente. Do you know who they are? One of the biggest health systems in America. And some of you that are my age, which I feel lucky to be my age, know, what, know about Watts. Watts in Los Angeles, where all the riots were in the 60s. It's a huge pocket of poverty then and now. And the woman was saying, who was presenting, she was vice president of strategic planning and communities. She had been there 13 years at Kaiser Permanente. They were going over the data with their board. And what they realized was there was one physician for every 300 patients in Watts. And five miles down the road in Chino, which is an upper middle class environment, there was one physician for every 30 patients. And she held up, she put up a, a visual, had a box. You know, we always say we're thinking in the box. The box was Kaiser Permanente. And the circle was the community. It had priorities, relationships, and beliefs, I think she had it. Which, to me, that's what Bridges is. I know they were using Bridges, even though they didn't say so. They merged the two, and they began to do focus groups, and they began to change, and they began to surround themselves by what the community needs were. Not just the community needs, but the individuals in that community. How do you get somebody in poverty to trust you 
enough to sit down with you and look at everything we're going to look at today. Some of you have been doing great relationships with folks from all economic classes for years. You have a key. You have, you're sort of an outlier, let's say. Now everybody in here has the same opportunity, how we share this, not blindly guessing, but having a strategy and an approach. The first time Bill Duvall and I started going out to present to social services in Ohio, we both lived in Ohio, people would bring their clients. And the clients would come, they were generational poverty, and they would go through bridges just like we're going to today. And basically, they would get emotionally hijacked. I'm going to tell a lot of stories today. Some of these stories might be your story. I'm going to show videos. Some of those videos might be your mom. When you're sitting in a room, and you have never really thought about this before, you've just lived your life, right? And you've not thought about your life and had a way to analyze it. You're going to come off the tracks emotionally. And Phil said, we can't have this. We need a venue, a kitchen table. A kitchen table where people can sit around the table and talk about these things and what it means to them. And so he developed getting ahead and just getting by world, which is the bridges when you're in poverty. It's a kitchen table. It's like 15 to 20 weeks, very interactive. People get to take their own approach, take time. You know, poverty, if you want to write this down, see what you think about it. I mean, you're not writing it down because you believe it, but I want you to write it down and look at it. Poverty is the tyranny of the moment. You're thinking about the now. You know what? Our agencies and government do that too when the funding gets low. We start putting band-aids on things instead of having long-term planning, you know what I'm talking about? So it's a natural thing when we have a crisis to just try to get through the now. Poverty is the tyranny of the moment. Getting ahead allows somebody to come with a group of people in poverty and have a break from the tyranny of the moment to think about their life, who they are, where they've been, where they want to go, and who their partners are going to be in that process. And also, all of the big picture stuff we're going to talk about today, like what are the hidden rules of poverty? What are the hidden rules of economic class in schools, in businesses, in agencies? What do I need to know if I'm going to be successful in poverty? What do I need to know if I'm going to be successful in the middle class environment? So, and then relationships are forged and built. And guess what happens? Excuse me. People in poverty truly get empowered. And at least three out of every ten people who go through getting ahead say this, I don't just want to do something about my poverty. I want to work with my community to make life better for everybody in my community. You know who those people are? Those are the people that are going to show up at your table, your decision-making table. My question to you is, are you ready for that? And is that something you want? Is there enough respect and relationship there that this would work right now? I think you're close if you're not already there. And so hopefully Bridges will give you an opportunity to go to that next step. The one I brought you today, there's three getting aheads. Uh, getting ahead and just getting by worlds, the basic. Getting ahead in the workplace is the one I, I brought because I figured you might have some people who are working but are struggling and who maybe keep changing jobs, which is a, a barrier for the entire community. You want people to be able to work and be employed and move ahead. So I brought you Bridges, oh, excuse me, getting ahead in the workplace as a door price. There's also, does anyone work with um, people transitioning? Uh, out of prison. There's also a, a getting ahead um, and getting out while getting out. So you might be interested in that. The other one I brought, because I knew there'd be a big health uh, group here, is Bridges to Health and Healthcare, which I had the opportunity to co author. And um, even though I, I'm not in healthcare, 
I was really uh, involved with wellness initiatives in my community because I was alcohol, drug prevention, behavioral health. So uh, there was a transition there. So those are the two door phrases. So you want to know how do you get that, right? So let's see how you do it. At the back of your handout, there should be a couple things. Oh, good. Welcome to our community. Would you uh, detach welcome to our community? Diane, do we have a box somewhere? Oh, extra handout? Okay. I assume you're going to hand out the evaluation later? Yes. But some people like to have them done by 10 a.m. Okay. That's just kidding. That way you can get out quickly. The end of the day. All right. Okay, so this, these directions are very difficult. If you want to get a newsletter from AHA Process Monthly, which addresses all sectors and what people are doing in our communities that use bridges and in our agencies and in health, <coughs> just put your email address down. If you don't want the newsletter, just put your name down so we know this is your ballot for the door prize. Now, if you would fold it in half, there's so many of you here today, and we're like, woo hoo, thank you for coming. Great turnout. Would you make sure that you fold it in half with your name showing so that when they go through today, at the end of the day, they can toss the ones that don't have the email address after we do the draw. And the other ones will go on that do have the email, go on to AHA process, and they'll be sending a newsletter. I try to be as humorous as possible. So far, you've been cooperating. But as you know, I'm not my usual humorous self today, so I keep trying. <clears throat> 